This video is brought to you by Film Convert. Frank Herbert's Dune is a classic in the realm of science fiction. It's notoriously hard to adapt, with previous attempts in converting the book series into movies faltering in one way or another through countless attempts over the years. From Jodorowsky's 14-hour film, Ridley Scott's attempt, Lynch's attempt, and even the TV series, they all fell short. Until director Denis Villeneuve, made it a reality in 2021. But Dune isn't easy to sum up into a single movie, and Denis knew that too, choosing to break the first book into two parts. And while this received mostly praise from audiences and critics alike, as well as being a box office success, the hard part came next, the sequel. Throughout the history of cinema, the sequel could be the catalyst for whether or not a series continues or just fades into cinema history. But we can say with some certainty that Denis has another hit on his hands, with director Christopher Nolan likening the film to The Empire Strikes Back. High praise for a film with sky-high expectations on it already. But just what is director Denis Villeneuve doing with Dune Part 2 to receive this much attention? Well, let's dig into what is probably one of the most anticipated sci-fi productions of the decade. Early on, while Warner Brothers had teased the idea of having a sequel to Dune Part 1, they were a bit tepid in confirming the green light before the film released, saying they would have to see how it performed on then HBO Max. Which, if we all remember, this was around the same time they arbitrarily decided to release their films to both streamers and theaters at the same time. And what could be a huge change for the future of movie going in this country, some of the biggest upcoming blockbusters will head straight to streaming. Warner Brothers announced all of its upcoming movies from Dune and Wonder Woman 1984 to the new Tom and Jerry movie will be on HBO Max on the same day they hit theaters. Leading to Christopher Nolan leaving his longtime studio partner for Universal to go make Oppenheimer, saying, Yeah, it's uh, sort of not how you treat filmmakers and stars and people who, you know, they, these guys have given a lot for these, these projects. and. Uh, they deserved to be uh, consulted and, and spoken to about what was going to happen to their work. And now they're being used as a lost leader for the streaming service, for the fledgling streaming service. Even Denis Villeneuve thought that this streaming service decision could cost the series a follow-up film if the streaming service hurt the box office totals enough. Saying in a heated statement, AT&T decided to sacrifice Warner Brothers, entire 2021 slate, in a desperate attempt to grab the audience's attention. Warner Brothers might just have killed the Dune franchise. Just days prior to release of Dune though, then HBO CEO Ann Sarnoff said, Will we have a sequel to Dune? If you watch the movie to see how it ends, I think you pretty much know the answer to that question. And despite the same day released HBO Max, Denis' film would go on to achieve a $437.0 million box office run against a budget of $165 million, which made a lot of people wonder what a Dune film could achieve without splitting time with a streamer. Well, sure enough, on October 26, 2021, Dune Part 2 would officially get the green light from Legendary and Warner Brothers to try that very thing. But this time, the director would secure a deal to direct the film on one condition, a guarantee of an exclusive 45-day theatrical window, saying, For me, it was a non-negotiable condition, Villeneuve said. I love streaming, I use streaming all the time, but I still think that contemporary movies need to have their chance. All movies need to have proper time in theaters. The theatrical experience is at the very heart of the cinematic language for me. With a theatrical release secured for Denis, he would go straight into production mode, wanting to get to work as soon as possible. Thankfully, due to a lot of work from the first film, they were not starting from scratch, and that would make production, I guess you could say, a bit easier. The writing process for director Villeneuve follows a trend that you would see a lot of auteur directors go after, storyboarding out everything before even pulling out a camera. And it's interesting to note here that the director had been making storyboards since childhood. As a teenager, he and his friend Nicholas would storyboard out the Dune adaptation they envisioned making someday. It's an old dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read the book when I was 13 years old and uh, my best friend, uh, Nicolas Kedzma, and I, we were like, let's say we were on the nerd side of things. We didn't have any camera, so we were drawing movies. So we were, and, and we were both in love with the book. And, and I remember doing some, some, uh, oh, here we go. 
Yeah, some storyboards. This is when you were 13 years old. Is this perhaps one of the few genuine I've dreamt about making this film since I was a child stories? It would certainly appear that way. And while he had his storyboard from his childhood, he would give it another go this time. For real. I feel still today, once the the, the screenplay is done, I will storyboard most of the movie, if not the entire movie, and it's a new way to rewrite and to approach, bring the words closer to the to the camera and I then once the storyboard I finish I rewrite the screenplay again again from the storyboards because there's a lot of changes that will be found through the storyboards a lot of props are created in in that process and and of course the all the cinematic language of the movie as far as dialogue though anyone familiar with past Villeneuve films knows that he tends to be a fairly contemplative director, trying to limit the amount of dialogue within his films, saying, Frankly, I hate dialogue. Dialogue is for theater and television. I don't remember movies because of a good line. I remember movies because of a strong image. I'm not interested in dialogue at all. Pure image and sound. That is the power of cinema. But it is something not obvious when you watch movies today. Movies have been corrupted by television. And while he's not a fan of dialogue, for the moments of dialogue he did write for, He tried his best to stick closely to Frank Herbert's vision, while also making sure to impart some of his own into it as well. When Frank Herbert wrote the first book, he was a bit disappointed how people perceived uh, the book, uh, because for him, Paul was not a hero. He was a, a dark figure. He was someone that it was for me. It was like the book, book was a cautionary tale about the uh, messianic figures. So I tried at my best to do this adaptation closer to the initial intention of Frank Herbert. Principal filming would begin on July 18th, 2022 in Budapest, Hungary. And like the last film, a lot of the awesome visual effects, tricks, and techniques they developed from in-camera to post-production would all be employed here. But there were some surprises. Villeneuve is often compared to Christopher Nolan, and maybe that could be a little bit to do with his love of the IMAX format too, but that's where the comparison stops from a technical standpoint, as Denis uses digital cinema cameras for his IMAX films. Though unlike many IMAX films filmed with digitally approved cameras, which usually end up at a IMAX 190 to 1 ratio, Denis would actually use the largest IMAX format available at 1.43 to 1, which is the size of the IMAX 70mm film. But just like Oppenheimer, while this is technically awesome, there are very few IMAX theaters that can actually show this format, including the theaters that can show the 70mm IMAX film, which Dune has a special release in select locations for. But how does Villeneuve and Oscar-winning cinematographer Greg Frazier achieve this with a digital cinema camera? Well, instead of cropping the shot of the Alexa LF signal, they utilize the full sensor. With Greg Frazier saying, when you shoot for IMAX with spherical lenses and a 1.43 aspect ratio, you're shooting that full LF sensor. So we shot the entire sensor when we shot with anamorphic. Then we also shot the full sensor spherically for IMAX. The desert's a, an amazing place to shoot, you know, and anybody that's spent time in the desert will realize there's a certain spirituality when it comes to the desert. and. Visually, that spirituality presents itself on camera. You just have to be willing to accept it. DP Greg Frazier does wish, though, that everyone could experience it at home, saying, I wish everyone had an IMAX screen in their living room, and I wish everybody was able to view it the way we intended. That's my wish. But the reality is you can't serve all those masters. So if you're near an IMAX theater that's showing it in its full IMAX glory, go see it. You'll likely be one of the few people to experience it in its entirety. And even if you don't, it's still worth a watch in IMAX. And speaking of film in general, both the first Dune film and part two would use a special film emulation process. Initially, they had tested out various forms of film from 65mm, IMAX, and 35mm film, but the film ended up looking a bit too dated for the look they were going for. But in the other direction, using all digital looked way too sharp. Frazier said, we just wanted to use the digital look, but to create softness, When we projected the film, it just didn't give us the feeling that we were after. It felt, as Denis put it, a little bit nostalgic, like we were watching something that has happened in the past. The digital, particularly when projected in IMAX, felt more contemporary, but it was a little too crisp. And that really was a challenge, considering Dune is a story that takes place without computers or robots or any real massive displays of technology. Part of their process after the lens choices and the cocktail of techniques to get their film to look softer was to transfer the digital footage over to 35mm film and then record it back to digital. 
when we looked at it and tested it, there was a sh- one particular shot of a sunset that was clear as day, no pun intended, mm. what the difference was. It was obvious. This one yeah. shot of the sunset, it became so clear that what the film did was it softened the edges of the digital and it gave us something that film acquisition couldn't give us and it also gave us something that uh, digital acquisition couldn't give us. They would get CPC London, the only film lab in the world that solely specializes in producing affordable 35mm motion picture film prints for filmmakers. It's honestly a fascinating process and one of the many that are trying to recapture that filmic magic that you get with real film stock. I can't use this process for any of my content. But honestly, that's totally okay, as the sponsor of today's video, Film Convert, has some awesome film emulation software that we use in every single video. Let me show you a couple of cool ways we use this film emulation software. Just last November, Film Convert added one of the four pillars of film emulation, halation. In simple terms, halation is a slight haloing effect around that of a bright image, leading to a bit of a soft bleed over dark edges. We found an interesting use case for this by giving our text we use for quotes, subtitles, and titling using that yellow style lettering and adding a bit of a black outline around it. Paired with Film Convert's film emulation and halation effect, it gives us this really cool vintage look that bleeds over the black border and onto the image behind it. Now you can even play with this a little bit more and add like a wiggle expression over it and add a gate weave effect essentially to it. Honestly, I could make an entire video on how we use Film Convert's film emulation software in our videos, but I can't recommend them enough. And if you'd like to try it out yourself, check out the link below in the description for 10% off either Film Convert Nitrate or Cinematch. Be sure to check that out in the link below. Now, let's talk about some infrared cameras. You haven't been living under a rock or just haven't seen many of the Best Picture nominees from 2023 you probably have noticed the constant use of black and white footage used in conjunction with color footage. Oppenheimer really being a standout, but far from the only film to do that. Dune Part 2, however, takes this to an entirely new level. Their black and white shots look otherworldly, consisting of milky and soft white tones, juxtaposed with tar-like black values. But what exactly is this? A color grading effect? Or could these visuals have been achieved completely in camera? The filmmakers would achieve this through using infrared cameras. Director Denis Villeneuve told an interesting story about this, saying, I explained to the studio, we shoot it this way, and there's no way we can go back. They signed with their blood, but it created a very powerful, eerie feeling that I love. What most of you might associate with infrared videos could be the night shot modes on those old cameras that allow you to see in the dark, using a spotlight at the front of a camera that could shoot out infrared light. You could record what is going on in front of you in a pitch black room, something that not only comes in handy from time to time, but which can also be a sought after creative tool. One movie that made use of a night shot type infrared video style was Don't Breathe, a horror film revolving around home invaders attempting to rob the home of a blind military veteran. In one scene, the lights go completely out, with the camera moving closer to the protagonists and the IR spotlight illuminating them in the darkness. Visuals which, while at times creepy, look relatively familiar. Other movies also make use of infrared in their editing pipeline, such as Jordan Peele's Day for Night scenes in Nope. For that film, they made use of a beam splitter configuration, armed with two IMAX cameras, one Panavision 65 film camera, and an Airy Alexa. This made them capable of shooting a captivating night scene in the day using the color information of the 65mm film and details of the infrared monochromatic recordings in order to stimulate the way our eyes adjust to the dark. However, looking at those scenes of Dune 2, it's quickly seen that neither of these two creative filming techniques were used here. So how were infrared cameras used in those shots? And more importantly, why? Why not just make use of regular black and white recordings? So when cutting out the ultraviolet and visible light spectrums and only shooting an image in infrared, the image turns monochromatic, with the foliage turning white, skin smoothing out, and the lighting conditions normally ideal for taking regular photographs don't matter as much as you might assume anymore. However, shooting in this light spectrum does come with some serious challenges. Materials that we are familiar with in our day-to-day -day lives, such as fabrics, liquids, hair, and synthetic compounds can look drastically different in infrared. This means that in costume and set building departments, a good amount of care was taken to ensure that all materials had the correct color, which means that there are combatants in the arena that could be wearing costumes that weren't black in the visible spectrum, but looked tar black on camera. And director Villeneuve loved the idea of using this visual saying, the idea that in different worlds, the laws of physics could be different. Maybe there are some stars in the universe where the light doesn't reveal colors. It's the opposite. It kills colors. I thought a black and white world would fit with their primitive mentality. 
It's a striking choice and almost perfect for the general look and feel for this film. Dune and Dune Part 2 possess a lot of practical effects and CGI throughout the film. One interesting practical effect they would employ for Dune Part 2 would take three months to film, this being the sandworm. For the scene everyone has been waiting for, Paul Atreides riding on a sandworm. And boy, does this film have a lot of sandworms. But what's rather interesting is part of it was filmed practically with what the director called the worm unit. You would get pulled onto that unit 20 or 30 minutes at a time, and they would slot the availabilities in relation to the main production schedule. And it was awe-inspiring. There was a wall this size of a shot list that they were dedicating, like you put three months to for what's ultimately a three-minute sequence. They got it as practically invigorating as they could, with a rig that shook violently without getting an actual sandworm, and it was a dream to shoot that. It's interesting to see scenes such as these still be used with practical effects, even if we can assume that there was still a lot done by digital artists to really sell it in the end. As we mentioned previously, a lot of the same techniques and tricks were used for this film as were for the first film, and that includes the VFX house that Denis has worked with for the past couple of films. With Deneg being responsible for a majority of VFX shots in the first Dune, having worked on 1,400 scenes out of the 1,700 total, and previously winning awards for their excellent work in other science fiction movies such as Blade Runner 2049. The production house clearly is an excellent choice for enhancing and realizing scenes found in Dune Part 2. With all the shots that require daylight needing to be filmed outside, for instance, and building a real ornithopter to fly around and being completely out of the question, the crew decided to place the ornithopter cockpit atop a gimbal on Budapest's high hill, surrounding the set with sand-colored walls. Then they would shoot the cockpit with the background out of focus. This combined with a massive desert plate shot in the UAE and some work in post results in a more than believable image, as the hard to recreate visuals of a real desert can be seamlessly blended with the fake special and digital effects. Speaking of sand, it helped to solve the biggest problem on set, avoiding green or blue screens by any means necessary. The idea behind using sand colored screen is in large part about getting the right lighting. Green or blue screens, of course, color the bounce light, which can negatively affect scenes and result in more cleanup work necessary in post. Green screens are often spotted by viewers, especially when actors look like cutouts in the scene. With the sand screen method, an edge would form around an actor, which would better blend into the scene through multiplication and addition effects. There's a question to be asked, however. Just how can the VFX artists isolate the actors from the background when they are using traditional green or blue colored backdrops? For that, we can look to a color wheel. The complementary color of blue is orange, meaning that when selecting the right hue and saturation for the sand screen, it can turn into a blue screen when inverting the color. This means that just like for a green screen, the sand screen needed a uniform color that was ideal for the shoot. That came about with lots of experimentation, approaching the correct hue in a reversed manner to get the ideal sand color. Different hues of blue paint were applied to wood, cloth, and even metal to then be inverted in order to see what the ideal color for the screen should be. With this figured out, the crew would then shoot with the CGI in mind. Austin Butler and Chalamet both had separately trained for their fight sequences for months, and the first time they finally met up was in the stunt room, where they started fighting immediately. So we were so enthusiastic, and uh, on the day it was the rare dream you have as an actor to have a physical task in front of you that matters, uh, not only uh, crucially to the story, but it's in some ways the climax, in front of some of the greatest actors in the world. We, we wanted to bring out the best in each other and mm -hmm. and try to kill each other without actually hurting each other, mm -hmm. you know? And honestly, this scene is one of the best of the film, employing wide angles and choosing to mostly stay away from the popular quick cuts, letting you actually see more of the fight unfold and understand it as it ramps up with intensity. But physical challenges weren't the only thing that Chalamet would have to work on for this film. In a pivotal moment of the film, he gives a speech that they decided to do in both English and the made-up language of Chaksaba. You're in a movie of this size and even playing a, one of the lead characters, and now I gotta step up to the plate here. You know, incredibly affirming and all the more bizarre to do it in a language that doesn't exist, you know? And have it memorized in English too, and we did it in English as well. But, you know, then he chose the Chikopsa, which I liked. I thought that was so much cooler, even if it's subtitled, you know. Uh, I think it's just a stronger choice. Principal filming was wrapped up on December 12th, 2022, but as Dune is now releasing to theaters and with high ratings from most critics and audiences, it should go on to have a very successful run at the box office. But this run of success may have never come to pass if its director hadn't returned home to science fiction, which is why you should check out our video on Denis Villeneuve, sci-fi's prodigal son, right here.